Hi, I'm Jay. And I'm John. And we're Bucket List Travellers. And today we're taking you on a walking tour of Barcelona, Spain. We're starting our Barcelona walking tour today along the Carrer de la Marina on the way to Sagrada Familia. And our first building of interest is the one on our right here, which is called La Monumental. The full name is Plaza de Toros Monumento de Barcelona. And it was actually a bullfighting ring. I thought it was a religious building, but no, this was a bullfighting ring for almost a century. So they started bullfights here back in 1914 and that continued until 2011. So it stopped when they banned bullfights in Barcelona. The Parliament of Catalonia passed a law banning bullfighting events in 2010 and that came into force in 2012. But actually that ban was overturned in 2016, but they haven't had any bullfights here ever since. What I found really interesting about this was that it has a capacity of almost 20,000 people for bullfights, but now that it's used mainly for concerts, the capacity is actually 25,000 people. Yeah, so that's because they use the arena area. Got it, standing room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a standing room. So that would be a really fantastic place for concerts, quite a lot of atmosphere I would think, and having it in such a historic building is pretty cool. So you can see off in the distance the Sagrada Familia. It's such an amazing and intriguing landmark. Yeah, so I don't know if you've ever been to a place that has one of these world famous landmarks, but to see it in a distance and see something that you've seen on your computer screen or on TV before and actually see it in the flesh, I'd always gives me a buzz. What I find really interesting about La Sagrada Familia is that you can see it from so many places throughout the city and you can see that they've got cranes, cranes on going. top. Yeah, so it's obviously a lot different, the construction work today, than it was when they first started building it. When did it start being built? Yeah, so it's been an ongoing construction site since 1882. So the 19th of March, 1882. Yeah, so it's been a very, very long time in the making. And so to begin with, one of the reasons why it was taking so long was that the... The building's privately funded. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and so the current funding is from ticket sales. So you can actually go and visit the Sagrada Familia and it's 26 euro entry. Yeah. Which is, I, th I, think, I think it was quite steep, but I guess it all goes towards the final completion of this amazing building. Yeah, and costs per year to develop the, the building are around 25 million euros a year. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so it isn't cheap. And it'll be so amazing to see it when it's completed. So when, when's it supposed to be completed? Well, it was supposed to be 2026 was the, the date, which would have been the centenary of the original architect, Anthony Gaudi. The centenary of what? No, uh, the centenary of his death. Oh, okay, right. The centenary of Anthony Gaudi's death. Unfortunately, due to COVID, the project had to go on hold. And so it's not, delaying everything, isn't it? Yeah, so we're not sure when it's going to be completed. But it's just fascinating watching it being constructed, I think. So when the Sagrada Familia is finally complete, its spires will make it the tallest church building in the world. I think that's 172 meters tall. Wow. And that's actually going to be 11 meters taller than the current record holder, which is Ulm Minster in Germany. And that's 161 meters high currently. The original design that Gaudi had envisioned had a total of 18 spires. So the number 18 represented the 12 apostles, the Virgin Mary, the four evangelists, I think they're the, the four people who wrote the Bible. Oh, like Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Yeah, 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 that's right. And then a final spire representing Jesus Christ. So that's the final stage of the project that we're in right now. And it is interesting to note that the construction only passed 50% in 2010. Yeah, so it's been really slow going up to that point. Yeah. To be fair, there has been a civil war in the meantime. So back yeah, in the, the 1930s. Civil war. 
Yeah, so that slowed things down a fair bit. As part of the Civil War, revolutionaries set fire to the crypt part of the, the church, which is coincidentally where Gaudi is buried. Oh. Yeah, and... So it really was his life's work. Yeah. He got buried there. Yeah, he certainly made it his life's work. So his original plans were destroyed in the Civil War. However, advances in technology over the years since have enabled architects to sort of piece together what he originally envisioned. And the architects today are trying to maintain the original vision of Gaudi. It's amazing seeing how this process has just been handed over from one set of architects to another or one set of builders. And currently, they're actually using computer modelling to get the, the architectural plans up in place. And so it's really come through the ages, hasn't it? Yeah, and you can see it now. It's Seeing it in person is just... Uh, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's it's otherworldly, the, the architecture. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to describe, to be honest. And what I find really interesting is that because it's been in the process of being built for so long, you have part of it that looks really old and then the spires, which just look really new and they've got so much colour in them. I wasn't expecting it to have the amount of colour and detail that it has. I thought it would just be all stone coloured. Stone coloured, yeah, yeah. But there are reds and greens. It's very vivid. Mm. You can see where we are right now. There are heaps of people around. This is arguably the biggest attraction in Barcelona. In, in Barcelona. And for good reason. It's just an amazing building. We only saw it from the outside, and it's very impressive from the outside. If you pay your 26 euro, you can go inside as well. I'm sure it's just as impressive inside as it is out. Yeah, and there's also a museum that outlines the whole construction period and different stages of the building. And what I found really cool is that across the road from La Sagrada Familia, there's a chocolate store and they had a chocolate model of La Sagrada Familia in their display window. Yeah, that was pretty impressive. From the Sagrada Familia, we're now taking you towards the historical centre of the city. Now, that building that you just saw a moment ago was Estacio del Norte, or the North Bus Station. Yeah, so this is the bus station that we arrived at when we came to Barcelona from another city in Spain called Zaragoza. And we also left from here to go to Andorra. It's a very popular bus station and there's a lot of good restaurants around this area as well. If you're doing intercity bus travel or even international bus travel, you'll probably pass through Nord Station. It was originally a railway station and it opened up in 1862. And it was used as the main railway for the city until 1972. And it was also used as a table tennis venue for the 1992 Olympics, which was held in Barcelona. Yeah, so now it's predominantly a long distance bus station, but there's also a sports hall still there as well. From the bus station, we're taking you towards the triumphal arch. You can see that big structure, maybe about 200 meters straight in front of us. This was built in 1888 and it was built as part of the Barcelona World Fair. I think people know them these days as the World Expo. Yeah. And this was the main access gate for that World Fair. Yeah, it was the gateway. Unlike other triumphal arches in the world, like the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, this arch is non-military. So it was built primarily as a gateway to the World Fair. Arc de Triomphe or Triomphe Arches, I didn't realise there were more than just the Paris one until we started travelling, but we've seen quite a few around the world. I think the first one that I saw outside of Paris was when we were in India on our first trip together. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, memories. But this one's a beautiful one. It's the gateway to a really nice park area. Yeah, that's the Parc de la Ciutadella. And what I find really interesting is that Spanish isn't the only language that's spoken here. The main language is Catalan. This area, Barcelona and the northeastern part of Spain, was originally Catalonia. And also Andorra and part of France, I think. In the 1700s, the Spanish took over this area and there's been some tension ever since. Catalan is spoken in Barcelona. It's also the official language of Andorra. 
and it's spoken a little bit in France as well. Yeah, so I believe Andorra is the only country in the world where the official language is Catalan. This promenade takes you all the way up to the Parc de Ciudadella, and it's a really lovely area. It's great for people watching, yeah. and it's a really nice open space. There's often performers and... I think we've got someone blowing bubbles and... Yeah, this is really cool. <laughs> I liked walking through this. There's always a lot of activity going on around here. Yeah, it's never a dull moment around this square. Let's just walk through these bubbles. <laughs> and now we'll just zoom you through to the park. So we're walking across the road now towards the Parc de la Ciutadella. And the reason why it's called Parc de la Ciutadella was because prior to the park, there was a big citadel or fortress there for the best part of a century. And at that time, it was actually the largest fortress in Europe. Yeah, yeah. So in 1714, during the War of the Spanish Succession, Barcelona was laid siege for 13 months by the army of Philip V of Spain. So the city fell. In order to maintain control over it, he built this citadel. This was a citadel that was actually built by the Catalans and it took three years. They were building the fortress. They also had to pay for the war that they'd just lost. And for the fortress. And for the fortress. So this citadel was a much hated symbol of the uh, central Spanish government, but it was in place for over a hundred years until it was eventually torn down in the 1840s to make way for the park that's here today. Yeah, and so this is now a 70-acre park and it includes the city zoo. And that zoo that's in this park was home to an albino gorilla called Snowflake, who was very popular until he unfortunately passed away in 2003. It includes the Parliament of Catalonia, a small lake, museums, and this amazing fountain, uh, which you can see ahead of us right now. Yeah, oh, I love this fountain. It's really beautiful and it's a great place to come for sunset. Yeah, so this fountain was also built as part of the expo in 1888 and it was loosely modelled off the Trevi Fountain in Rome, Italy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so there's a few cafes around here and kiosks so you can get something to eat or drink and just admire the view while you're here. Another interesting fact about the fountain here is that Anthony Gaudi, the guy who designed the Sagrada Familia, was at the time a, an unknown student of architecture and he had some involvement in designing this. Oh wow, so he's had his hand in a couple of the big monuments around the city. Yes. We're now heading out of the park area towards the historical centre of Barcelona, in particular the El Born Quarter. And as we move out of the park, you can actually see a full orchard of orange trees here. It's really lovely seeing a lot of fruit trees all around Spain. Yeah, the climate is just perfect for growing citrus. And it reminds us back home in Australia, we have some citrus trees growing in our yard, actually. Yeah, a little taste of home. Yeah. So the El Born area is one of the most in-demand areas for property in Barcelona and it's full of hip restaurants and it's got little boutique shops with designer clothing in it and it's a really funky area so lots of little narrow laneways that you can go and explore and get lost in. I really like this area. It is very similar to the Gothic Quarter, however it is different. Historically the Gothic Quarter was home to the more affluent residents of Barcelona, however the Born area was in decline over the last couple of centuries and only recently, since the 1992 Barcelona Games, the Born area had seen a revival. I guess there was a gentrification that occurred which made this area really high in demand and in fact the real estate prices in this area were the highest in Barcelona and even in the country right up until the economic crisis back in 2008. This big building on the right here that you see is the El Born Museum. Yeah, so this is a really fascinating museum. If you go inside, it looks like a market hall on the outside, but on the inside, it's this massive archaeological dig. And they actually discovered it while they were planning to renovate the 
old market hall to put in a library, they found all these intact buildings and streets and distilleries and all sorts of different things which date back to the 1700s when the old citadel was here. Yep, and there is even some archaeological dig areas that date back to the Middle Ages as well. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. So we highly recommend going there if you're in Barcelona. I've never seen anything like it. It's, it was quite fascinating. There are a lot of exhibitions around what life was like back in the early 1700s. The outside of the museum is still the same cast iron structure that was built way back in 1876 and that was the first market hall of its kind in Barcelona. Yeah, so it had cast iron architecture in the modernist style. We hope you're enjoying the walking tour so far. This is one of many walking tour videos that we've done throughout the world. So if you do like videos like this and travel videos in general, then don't forget to subscribe. So now we're just walking through some of the alleyways in the Bourne Quarter. And as you can see, it's got quite a unique feel to it and it, it is really narrow. Yeah, but it's a really charming area and there's just so many interesting little shops inside and little art installations. So you could really lose yourself in this area for hours. Oh, and definitely go to a tapas bar if you're in the area. This place is renowned for its tapas bars. And in particular, busque tapas known as Montaditos. So they're all spread around the small streets of the neighbourhood. Yeah, and there's an actual chain called 100 Montaditos, which has a very large menu with 100 types of Montadito or different tapas. tapas. Yep. And on Wednesdays and Sundays, they have a one euro special. So a lot of their tapas on their menu are one euro, or I think there's some that are two euro, and it's such great value. Oh, and so much to choose from. It's so tasty. So yeah, definitely if you're in Spain on a Wednesday or a Sunday, go to 100 Montaditos. One of the really cool things about uh, walking through these walkways is that there are no cars that you have to navigate your way past. However, every now and again, there might be a motorbike and there might be a cyclist coming through as you've just seen. Yeah, so you just got to keep your wits about you around here. Scooters are quite popular in Spain as well. And just on your left here, we have the Picasso Museum. So there's some really great museums around. And on your right, there was an ethnologic museum as well. So in this quarter, there's some really, really good museums. So there's a contemporary art museum as well. Uh, just yeah, the so it's, too. it's really just a centre of art and culture around here and food. Yeah, and we even saw this one, which was a, an art gallery of Australian Aboriginal art, which was pretty cool. Yeah, nice to see a slice of home here in Spain. Yeah. Yeah, so I really love the atmosphere around the Bourne Quarter. You can see a lot of people just soaking in the sights and it's a really popular tourist area in Barcelona. And if you're looking to do some souvenir shopping, then this area is a really cool place to get your little trinkets for your trip. Yeah, oh, and art pieces as well, because there's so many art galleries around here. So you can see there's a lot of little restaurants in the side alleys. And sometimes if you go into a restaurant, it looks deceptively small from the front, but they might have a, a garden area in the back, as we've discovered in a couple of them. So you can spend a whole day here just eating and shopping and exploring the area. And this is just the Bourne Quarter. So we're coming up to the Gothic Quarter, which is the historical centre of the city, which is quite a similar feel to this area. However, it is probably the most touristy part of Barcelona. So you've got a lot of hotels and a lot more shops and alleyways as well as well as a lot of historical buildings and churches and cathedrals and a lot of tourist attractions. So even though the Bourne Quarter is known for its little labyrinth of alleyways, it does actually open up into some really nice plazas or squares. So this one that we're coming to right now, what's it called? That's the Plaza of Santa Maria, Plaza de Santa Maria. And Plaza de Santa Maria is home to this church, which is Santa Maria del Mar, which actually dates back to the 1300s. 
Yeah, so what is quite unique about this church is that it was funded by the common people as opposed to the nobility. And in addition, the style of the church is known as Catalan Gothic. And it's a beautiful building. In particular, a feature I really love is the window above the doorway, which is that circular window known as a rose window because of the pattern of the window. Yeah, it's really pretty, isn't it? And this church has been very resilient over the centuries. So it survived earthquakes, it survived the Spanish War and uh, the Spanish Civil War, and it was burning for 11 days uh, during the Spanish War. Whoa. Yeah, and it's... It, and it's still standing. And it's still standing. So you can see a lot of outdoor dining in Barcelona. It's quite popular to dine outdoors, even during winter. And you actually have to pay extra for the privilege of dining outdoors in many of the restaurants in Barcelona. It'll be between 10 and 15% more than if you eat inside. And so you'll see a price that might be terraza versus a price that's sala. So sala is like the dining room indoors, whereas the terraza is the terrace outdoors. What is the custom in Spain is to have a really large meal for lunch and then have some smaller plates or the tapas for dinner much later at night. Mm. Yeah, and the meal of the day specials in a lot of the restaurants in Spain are really good value. So you'll often get a three course meal and how much were they? Well, they were probably between 10 euro to 15 euro in Barcelona. Hmm. Yeah, so great value and you get a lot of food for that. And yeah, the food in Spain is just so good. Yeah, amazing. Oh yeah, and if you're interested in learning more about Spanish food, we've put together a Madrid food guide, so make sure you check that out. We're now crossing the road from the Born Quarter into the Gothic Quarter. Now the Gothic Quarter is the historic centre of the old city of Barcelona and it has part of the oldest parts of the city. So this includes the city's Roman wall as well as several notable medieval landmarks. One such medieval landmark is the Plaza del Rey which is the big building that you can see up on our left ahead of us. So these days the Plaza del Rey contains the Museum of the History of Barcelona. So this is another archaeological site which is also very interesting and it's got some pieces of architecture that date back to early Christian times. It's just mind-boggling to think about how old some of these archaeological artifacts were. So there were headstones that dated all the way back to the first century AD. So that's like 2000 years ago. Yeah, absolutely amazing. There are also ruins of old fabric workshops old winemaking workshops. It was just a really fascinating area. There was also part of the museum above the archaeological remains that outlined the growth of Barcelona in more contemporary times, so the 19th and 20th century. So that was also really fascinating to understand. Yeah, so you can really get a really good overview of the history of Barcelona all the way back through the ages. We're now coming into the square that holds the Cathedral of Barcelona. So you can see in front of us you've got some beautiful markets on display. This was actually filmed just before Christmas and so we've got the Christmas markets here in Barcelona. Christmas markets in Europe are just fantastic. You've got all these beautiful little stalls selling lots of different Christmas decorations and Christmas ornaments and then you've got food and mulled wine. So many different things to feast your eyes on and if you're in the mood for shopping this is a great place to come. Yeah so it's pretty quiet right now but it really kicks into gear at night time and it gets very busy and there's a lot of atmosphere. So you can see this beautiful building in front of us is the Cathedral of Barcelona. It's also known as the Cathedral of the Holy Cross and Saint Eulalia. That's quite a mouthful. Yeah, I think, hopefully I said that right. So this is a Gothic cathedral, and it's also the seat of the Archbishop of Barcelona. The cathedral was constructed from the 13th century, and it took around two centuries to complete. We're now taking you to the Mercat de la Boqueria, which is one of the most famous markets in all of Barcelona. And it actually dates back to 1217, when the tables were installed at the old city gate to sell meat. Yeah, 
So it has a big, strong tradition of markets in Barcelona. And what's really interesting about Barcelona is that it's got 39 different fresh food markets. You don't have to go far to find markets in any of the neighborhoods of Barcelona. It's definitely somewhere you need to come, not only for the food, but for the atmosphere and for just getting immersed in local culture. You can see a lot of seafood markets here. If you're familiar with Barcelona, then you'll know that it's a seaside city set on the Mediterranean. And with that comes a lot of fresh seafood. So make sure that you try a lot of seafood when you're in Barcelona. And coming to the markets is a great place to come for getting your seafood fix. And you can see here that there's raw seafood that you can purchase to cook later, but there's also seafood that you can purchase to eat right there. Yep, you can't get much fresher than that. You can see a lot of butchers around here. And as I mentioned before, this market is known as the Mercat de la Boqueria. Boqueria is believed to have come from the word boc, which is Catalan for goat. And so a boqueria would be a place where goat meat is sold. Barcelona is quite a sprawling city. So we've now skipped ahead to the far end of the city and we're at the Palau Nacional de Montuic. So this palace was built as the main site for the 1929 International Exhibition, or Expo. So Barcelona's actually had two international exhibitions in its time. This site is just a magnificent grounds, and since 1934 it's been home to the National Art Museum of Catalonia. The area of Montjuic was also used as the main site for the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. So you can see the old Olympic Stadium, which is still there and still used for different sports. It is also the area for the Olympic swimming and diving arena. And it's really fascinating because it's an outdoor arena and you have this amazing backdrop of the whole city behind you because it's right up on the mountain top. Oh, it's such an impressive view. I don't know how you could compete when you're just distracted by that amazing view behind you. It was, it's just phenomenal. Yeah, spectacular. So these four pillars that you see in front of us are, are really important monuments. They're seen as the symbolic representation of Catalonia. So the four columns represent the four stripes of the Catalan flag. So these were erected in 1919. They were torn down in 1928 during the dictatorship of Miguel Primo de Rivera to get rid of any symbol of uh, the Catalan identity. However, they were restored in later years. And this beautiful fountain that we have in front of us is known as the Magic Fountain. It was built also for the International Expo in 1929. And one feature that I really love about it is that it lights up in beautiful colours at night. Well, the fountain is magic because it has a full-on display of lights, colour and music. Unfortunately, during COVID, there aren't any displays, but in normal times, I believe there'd be displays every half hour, every weekend. But even just seeing it lit up at night is beautiful. Yeah, we were very lucky that we came in at dusk and as you can see, I had the camera on it just as it switched on. So that was really cool. Perfect timing. Yep. We hope you enjoyed our walking tour of Barcelona. Let us know by hitting that like button and leaving a comment. We are Bucket List Travellers. See you next time.